Welcome everybody, thank you. Okay. Right, good afternoon everybody. Um, before we get started with our exciting episode today, a few house rules. Uh, please keep your mics muted, cameras off, and um, when we get to the Q's and A's, you can possibly put your, your cameras back on if you'd like to. And uh, if you do have questions during the presentation, please log them on the chat box so we can acknowledge them at the end. Um, we will also give you time to, uh, to ask your questions if you don't want to type it in the chat box. Having said that, um, a very warm welcome to everyone that has joined us today. My name is Michelle Swick. I'm the chairperson of the Inland Committee, and I would like to thank you for attending our 10th and last episode of our Concrete Fix for this season, 2021. Um, let me just quickly share my screen for you. All right. Down. Oh, apologies, guys. Let me just quickly get my. Can everybody see that, Hanley? Are you seeing this yet? Nothing yet. Nothing yet. Thank you, Brian. Mesh, click the share screen button first and then select your presentation. There you go. Perfect. And just in presentation mode. Thank you. Ah. Thank you very much. Right. Um, let's try again. <laughs> right, everybody on this on the same page as me. Yes, thank you. Great. So I want to start today by acknowledging the members of the CCSO body. Um, they are also part of our extended family in our industry. So thank you to our partner members, Afrisan, Lafarge, PPC, and Faku, Gold members, Semza and Creso, Silver members, Shirley Redimix, Corestruck, Quick Group and Sika. And thank you to our bronze members for you to view. And some more. And we are grateful for our associate members of FASA, CMA, FISA, the Corrosion Institute of South Africa, and SICI. And we are proud to embrace our students who are the future of our industry. So thank you to our academic members as well. To our guests today that aren't members of the Concrete Society, of, of the Cement and Concrete the SA body, sorry, old habits. <laughs> I'd, um, but you would like to join P. There are a variety of membership options with many benefits available. They are on the website. Uh, please go and log on to the website and have a look, or you can contact Natasha Pulse directly. Um, and please remember to follow us on our LinkedIn page. The latest edition of our magazine, uh, Concrete Baton, is available online for you. Um, it's got great technical articles. Please go take a look. You won't be disappointed at all. We have the 10th edition of the Fulton's Concrete Technology. Um, the, hardcover is uh, the hardcover edition is available from on our website and at a discounted price to our members for 990 Rand. The School of Concrete Technology is, um, you can log on to their website and you can have a look at the education program for 2022 that is also available at, uh, on the website. Before I introduce Brian, um, I'd like to present the Inland Committee to you. We are all passionate about cementing concrete and we are very excited to, 
to share the event of, of um, the events we have lined up for you in the new year. You can look forward to a couple of site visits. One of them is to the largest cylindrical post-tension concrete reservoirs in the world. And the other is to one of the tallest buildings in the heart of Africa's richest square mile. We also have a great lineup of technical. Ooh, if someone's joining us, thank you. <laughs> we also have a great lineup of technical, networking, and student events, and these are just mentioning a few. They're not even all up there yet. So, if you are not a member, I urge you to join our body to be part of Cement and Concrete SA. Moving on to the reason why we are here today. And, and that is to hear about specifying concrete and related specifications. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker today is a linchpin in our industry and really needs no introduction. Brian Perry is the CEO of the Cement and Concrete SA body. He has a bachelor's and a master's degree of science in civil engineering from WITS. He's a registered professional engineer. He is also a fellow of the South African Academy of Engineering, a member of the Institute of Concrete Technology in the UK, and an honorary member of the International Society of Concrete Pavements. He's authored a number of books on concrete floors and concrete roads and sections of a number of editions of the Fulton's Concrete Technology. He's authored a large number of papers for publication and he's presented at local and overseas seminars, conferences and symposia. He was a board member of the Concrete Society, a past president of the South African Road Federation and the, the past vice president of the International Society for Concrete Pavements and he chairs the South African Bureau of Standards Subcommittee of Cement, Concrete and concrete products. Ladies and gentlemen, who better to get insight from? Would you please welcome Brian Perry? Thanks very much, Michelle. Can I share my screen? Great, we can see. Thanks, Brian. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, obviously, it's quite a difficult topic to talk about. There's a lot of detail in specifying concrete. I just really want to take you through some of the, the basic principles and then also talk a little bit about some of the changes that are coming with uh, concrete and concrete-related specifications and test methods in South Africa. So the sort of outline of what I talk about is why do we have standards and specifications? talk about the little various types of specifications and what to actually specify. And that varies obviously from project to project. Talk a little bit about standard specifications, where they're appropriate and where you need to do something more than just having standard specifications. Talk a little bit about some of the guidance on drafting specifications and some of the pitfalls and typical scenarios that we've come across over the last many years. Um, and then talk a little bit about the changes that are coming and there, there are significant changes coming to a lot of the specifications, test methods, and so to give you some update on, on what's happening there. And then um, draw some implications from that and hopefully draw a few conclusions. So firstly, why do we have standards and specifications? I think there's three basic requirements. Obviously to control things on a construction site um, so that Everyone knows what has to be done and what's expected of them. Both the engineer saying this is what he needs and the contractor knowing that that's what he's got to actually provide. Good specifications provide protection to all parties because the, everything can be measured back to what was specified and did the parties meet it or didn't meet it. And largely to assess, uh, have, has the contractor actually met the requirements of the specification in terms of strength, in terms of tolerances, in terms of a whole range of, of different things. So to my mind, those are the three critical aspects why, why we put standards and specifications together. The problem comes when we start looking at the detail within the standards and specifications. One thing I was taught very early in my career 
is be very careful and try to avoid specifying anything that you cannot be that cannot be measured or assessed. It doesn't help saying that this must happen if there's no quantifiable way of assessing whether it has happened or hasn't happened. So I think that's something to always bear in mind when you're putting specifications together. Make sure that they're sometimes it's impossible, or very difficult. Try and avoid specifying anything that can't be measured or can't be assessed. <clears throat> Effectively, there's two types of, of specification um, or basic types. Firstly, the prescriptive type, which really that's where you actually tell the contractor exactly how to do it. So in other words, you'd specify concrete in terms of a 133 mix or a 144 mix or plaster in terms of a 1 to 6 mix and screeds in terms of a 1 to 3. And specifically with screeds is a big problem we look at at the moment because that's all the contractor has to comply with, provided he can prove that he's actually mixed it to those proportions. If you don't have any requirements of there as to what sort of workability it has to have, how it should be compacted, how it should be finished, how it should be cured, all the contractor and a lot of specifications we see, particularly with the architectural specs, is that all it says is one to three cent, cent cement screed. Um, and then you end up with problems. You know, if you're going to do it prescriptively, you need to tell him exactly how to do it. The other option is performance specifications. And there, effectively, you tell the contractor what's required as an end product and leaves them to work out how to do it. Often that becomes a problem where the, the client says, uh, I want a 30 MPA concrete. And what he actually wants is a flexural strength of four and a half uh, or some other abrasion requirement. Uh, he doesn't specify it. And then there's a fight at the end as to whether it doesn't actually meet what he thought he was looking for. So I think it's very, the, the intention generally these days is to move far more to performance specifications provided you can actually specify the criteria for measuring and assessing uh, to determine whether the contract has actually met what has to actually be done. The question is what to specify, and I've listed in alphabetical order all the possible things that could be uh, specified in terms of concrete. I'm not going to read through them, and that's by no means all of them, but there are literally hundreds of different properties or uh, assessment tools whatever, to try and specify concrete. And it, one needs to try and make sure that you choose the ones that are relevant for your particular project. And it'll be different from project to project. And standard specifications tend to accommodate a, a sort of mix of most of these, but often they're not enough on your particular project. And then you need to use the standard specification together with the project specification. And there's by no means more of those. I'll talk about some of these just now in terms of uh, textures, in terms of finishes, in terms of slump and things like that, how they can be problematic to specify. I think the, the, the critical thing is that you uh, need to identify what is critical. What are the parameters that you need for your structure to perform adequately uh, under traffic or under, uh, under use? Then to question, is it contained in a standard specification or all those properties that you're looking at in the standard specification? If so, which standard specification? If not, then you need to include it in a project specification. Far too often we get called out to see where there's just been a standard specification issued, something like 1200G, and really what the client or the engineer wanted is not really built in there, he assumed it is. So critically on, on critical projects, you then need to go through that standard specification and say, well, this clause is not adequate enough. This clause doesn't address what I need. I need to add additional clauses and to then put them in a project specification. And I'll show you an example of um, how not to do it just now from an ESKIM spec. Obviously, when you put those criteria in that project specification, you need to ensure that what you specify, as I've said already, need to be quantifiable and measurable. And you then need to state the acceptance criteria which often doesn't, isn't there. It'll tell you we want the strength, but it doesn't say, well, how many tests do you have to do and how many tests have to pass for it to be acceptable and things like that. So a lot of them are there. For example, not in the specification, but in the code for assessing cores, there's criteria there for assessing whether those cores that you've drilled and tested, whether they meet the, the specification criteria. What standard specifications are there? There are a whole lot of them. They're obviously, the ones that come to mind is SAB's, SAB's standard range of standard specifications, either the 2001 or the uh, 1200. There might be SOE specifications. Sorry, the other one is COTO, which generally is the road, road authorities specification. 
And you may not all be aware that that document was released, the latest version. That's the first time it's been updated since 1996. Um, it's about four times longer than the original document. Um, and really it's taken three, four years, lots of experts working on it. So it's a very, very good specification, standard specification, if you want to look at it from a concrete structures point of view or concrete pavements point of view. Sometimes for industrial pavements, it might be a bit over the top, but there might be some clauses in there that you may want to build into your standard specification. There may be SOE specifications. Eskom, I know a lot of the big uh, mining houses in the past used to have their own in-house project specifications, which were generally based on the standard SANS, SANS documents. The problem is the standard specifications will never address all of the above properties that we listed earlier and more adequately for every type of project. And so you need to go through those standard specification and see what it doesn't address or doesn't address adequately, and then put those requirements in your project specification. Some examples uh, where there's problems in uh, standard specifications. Uh, the one problem is in terms of flatness and levelness and degree of accuracy, other tolerances. I'll talk a little bit about that just now. Use of outdated specifications, 1200G is way out of date. It was withdrawn in 2007, it was superseded in 2007. Um, it's still available. Uh, SANS will still sell it to you, but they've withdrawn it. It's not on their list of standard specifications anymore. One of the other issues is if you look at slump, um, and one of the problems, you all know the slump test, we say that that assesses workability. I'd beg to differ that it doesn't assess workability, it just assesses consistency of the concrete. The reason I say that is if you look at these two slump, slump, uh, slump concrete, uh, they both have very, very similar, work, uh, very similar slump, but very, very different workability. And the way to assess that is to when you've done the, the, the slump test, is to take the rod and tap the base plate. And you'll obviously see the one on the right is a nice cohesive mix that will continue to flow downwards. Whereas the one on the left, when you tap the, the base plate, it's going to fall apart. So not very cohesive or anything like that. So you can't always just go on the slump test. And if you specify, be careful. We find people who specify a slump of 50 millimeters and then try and hold the contract to that. Bear in mind, the slump test is only accurate to plus or minus about 25 millimeters. So you can't really specify it much more accurately than that. How not to specify? This is the ESKIM specification for Kusili and Madupi. Um, and uh, this is what it includes. The first three, four items there, uh, SANS 10100, parts 12109 and 0155, are codes of practice. They are not specifications. A contractor cannot comply with them. This is the contractual specification. Contractor cannot comply with those particular specifications. Application of the build, national building regulations is another code of practice. It's not a specification. It then contains the cement and cement extenders and the cement types, the sort of cements down here, 471626. This specification was issued in around 2000. Those specifications were withdrawn in 1996. So there's no excuse for not having them in there. Um, then they go through all the test methods. You can see their spelling mistakes and everything. This is taken directly out of their specification. It then carries on through a whole lot of other test methods and everything like that, which is fine. Um, then also they've got here, uh, you'll see down here, SANS 50197-1 and 2 for cement. Now, which one is the contractor supposed to comply with? The one here for 471 or one of these ones with extenders? Or is it, should it be with this one? There's immediate confusion. Which one must the contractor comply with? And that's not all of the, the specifications. Uh, they then include also the 1200G and uh, 1200 series. And those conflict with some of the other methods that they've required. They also list this whole range of American Concrete Institute codes. And they are codes of practice. They are not specifications. So one can't use them as a specification. And it's very clear on the front page of each of those ACI documents, it basically says this is not a specification. It is a guide. Engineers may want to use it as a basis for writing a specification, but it is not to be used as a specification. And yet Eskom have thrown them all in there. And immediately there's a number of problems. For example, there's requirements here for hot weather concreting, cold weather concreting, which are different to those that are included 
in 1200G and in 10100 part two. So now which one applies? And there's been a large number of conflicts on those, con on those construction sites where Eskom says, no, you must do it to ACI and the contracts are saying, but uh, I did it to 1200. So be very, very careful that you try and, and I know what Eskom's done here. They've tried to specify every possible thing they can using every specification known. And it really, at the end of the day, it creates a problem. As I said, you cannot specify codes of practice. They're not specifications. That's why you need the project specification on some jobs to address specific properties. In addition to that whole list of specifications, they then also had a project specification which altered the 1200G requirements just to add to injury. And really at the end of that, it's total confusion. No one knows what they're supposed to comply with. Not the contractor. Eskim decide on one particular job, it's this clause. Another particular job, it's that clause. So just be very, very careful of trying to over-specify, which is exactly what, what Eskim have done on those two projects. How should you draft specifications? And I think really one should try and use standardized specifications wherever possible. And the reason for that is that the contractor will know generally what the right requirements are, the basic requirements. If you're using 1200G or 2001 or the COTO document, if the contractor starts using it, he gets to know it. He doesn't have to read through a totally new specification every time on a project. So he knows what the standard requirements are, but um, one needs to modify those for a particular project. And the problem is that if every specification is a homegrown one, contractors will have a great difficulty in pricing and often tender periods are very, very short which doesn't give the contractor much time to actually, um, to actually put the, the tender together if he's got to read pages and pages and pages of documents. Over, once you've decided on a standard specification that probably addresses most of your requirements, it's then the engineer needs to go through that standard specification to, to ensure it has all the requirements, for all the properties he needs for his design to be successful. So for example, in 1200G or 2001, there's no abrasion resistance test. So you may want to add something like that in there. Um, durability may be very critical. Uh, the project may be in a very aggressive environment. So you may want to specify any particular cement types could be used. And then you draft a project specification to add all those additional requirements or to modify the existing requirements. And I think that's critical for any successful job where you have the standard specification, which deals with the bulk of the items, which are standard on all jobs um, in terms of uh, tolerances of batching and mixing and all of those sorts of things, which generally don't change. But then you have a project spec, which adds your particular requirements uh, to, or to modify them. Some examples where we've ended up with problems um, or examples is, we have durability requirements. As I said, they may require specific cement types. They may require coatings. They may require other stuff where you can't change the concrete, so you've got to do something else to it. One big problem we have is slopes for drainage. Um, often engineers are uh, forced by clients to give very, very flat slopes, uh, and, but then the client complains about water pooling. Um, generally, for adequate water drainage, you need a minimum of 2% preferably about 3%. Anything less than that, you run the risk of water standing in places. Um, I think if you're a flooring contractor, one thing you need to do when you're handing your floor over is make sure that it's dry and there's no free water on it because water will show up any and every low spots. If you're the engineer, you may want to put water on the floor to try and show how, how out of tolerance it actually is. And one particular one that creates a lot of problem is in terms of tolerances, uh, using de to de degrees of accuracy in the SANS documents where they have three degree of accuracy, one, two, and three. Uh, one is the tightest, three is the, the, the most lax. Unless you specify one, then degree of accuracy two is, is accepted to be the, the defining one. And that is a five millimeter, plus or minus five millimeters under three meter straight edge. So now we come to do a straight edge test. How do you do it? Um, first of all, it'll kill your back and knees if you do it this way. And also, you can't put it directly on the floor. And none of the SABS methods say how you should use the straight edge. It just says plus or minus five millimeters under three meter straight edge. If you put it down directly on the floor and the one end is in a low spot 
and there's a high spot in the middle of the three meter straight edge, the one end is going to be way up in the air. And that's not a true reflection of the overall flatness of the floor. So generally what you need to do is to put it up on blocks. So you put it on 20 millimeter blocks and then you measure underneath the straight edge, sorry, you measure underneath the straight edge so that it mustn't, if you use 20 millimeter blocks, mustn't be more than 25 or less than 15 the gap. Having said that, it doesn't say how many of those ups and downs you can have. And effectively, you can have a corrugated floor, provided the corrugations aren't more than plus or minus five along the length of that straight edge. It will not guarantee you a flat floor, it might guarantee it an overall sort of flatness, but it's not going to be very flat. So in your specification, it can't be easy. You take a straight edge, lay it on the floor, measure the gap. It's not as simple as that. As I've said, you need to put it up on blocks and then use a wedge, a graduated wedge like this, where you can actually push it underneath. But it does not define how many of those ups and downs, as I've said. You can end up with a corrugated floor that is still within tolerance. The next problem is, where do you take the tests? Do you take them longitudinally? Do you take them transversely? Do you take them diagonally? How do I record them? And what are the acceptance criteria? If I take a thousand readings and I get one out, does that mean the floors failed? Is it 10 out of a thousand? Is it 100 out of a thousand? None of that stuff is specified. And unfortunately, that straight edge test in terms of flatness and levelness, you can drive a bus through it. It's almost impossible to, to enforce. The other problem that a lot of people don't understand is that you can have slabs that are flat, but not level. In other words, it's, it's very, very flat, but it's not level. So one end is higher, slightly higher than the other. And you can also have slabs that are level. In general, they're level, but they're not flat. They've got wavelength in it. So one needs to be aware of that. I'm not sure of the right way to, to deal with it, with general slabs. When it comes to warehouse floors, there are very strict guidelines in the British Concrete Society Technical Report 34, where you use a whole lot of very sophisticated pieces of apparatus to measure flatness and levelness. The other problem, big problem we have, and I just was involved in a site fairly recently, the definition in the document to the concrete finish says smooth. Now, how smooth is smooth? What one person thinks is very smooth, another person may not think it's very smooth. So it's very, very difficult to use that definition. And that's what happened on this job, where the engineer said it wasn't smooth enough, and the contractor said, no, it's more than smooth enough. Tell me how you're saying that it's not smooth. And how do you prove, prove it is smooth? What is smooth? You also need to be careful. You may have early strength requirements in the case of cutting joints and floors. You may have particular materials where you're looking for durability, where you've got to use particular cement materials or particular aggregate material. Um, in the case of roads, uh, you can't use dolomitic type materials because they tend to polish very easily. So you then got to blend it with silicious materials. So you need to make sure those requirements are all over and above the standard specifications. And as I mentioned, the new Koto spec is a very good spec and the Sandral project specs generally on top of those are, are really good. They, they take their time to make sure that anything that's not addressed in the Koto spec on a specific project then gets addressed in their particular project spec. So I think that's a very good thing like that. Okay, so what uh, standard specification can one use? Obviously that depends on the contract and the project. If you're building a road, I would preferably use uh, the Koto type documents. If it's a civil contract, if you're doing a bridge also, the Koto documents are very, very good, very up to date. When it comes to the, the SAVS documents, uh, 1200G, which most people use, uh, was superseded in 2007 and has been withdrawn by the SABS. So it still contains the old specifications, which were replaced in 1998. The most up to date one is SANS 2001 CC1. The problem with it is that, and why people don't like using it, is that it does not include the measurement and payment items. And generally on most projects, they would specify the 1200 suite, whether it's for the earthworks, for the concrete, for the pipes, for the sewers, for the stormwater. And the problem is a lot of clients don't want to use those because if they use a blend, not all of the two 1200s have actually been converted into the 2001. So if you end on a project where you've got some 1200s and some 2001s, you've got some with, um, with payment and measurement items and others that don't. The reason for that is uh, in the meeting that was held when they decided to move them all to 2001 series was in 2001. So we're already 20 years down the line and it hasn't happened. 
Um, and the reason for that is SABS's mandate is only to put together specifications. They are not mandated to do measurement and payment. So they can only put specifications. So that's where they're moving to, to take the payment and measurement items out. Following that meeting in 2001, um, the problem has been that there are no committees that deal with some of those 1200 standards. No one's interested in dealing with the road standards that prefer to use the KOTO type documents. And my understanding is the new KOTO document is now binding on all road authorities. So in other words, national, provincial, local, um, and in the past, often municipalities would use the 1200 series. So they're now bound to use the KOTO documents. And um, so, but the problem is there's no committees that deal with sewer pipes and manholes and things like that. So that's the reason not all of them have been converted. Most of them have been, or a lot of them have, but there's still a lot that haven't. To overcome that, if you do want to use the 2001 series, the ones that are there, um, obviously to deal with measurement and payment items, SASI, um, a couple of years ago, uh, borrowed or modified uh, institution of civil engineering document called Civil Engineering Standard Method of Measurement, which gives you a way of providing and putting together a, a measurement, payment and measurement uh, clauses. So uh, the document is available. My understanding is it's available from SASI for sale. So there is a way around dealing with the fact that the 2001 series do not include um, measurement and payment items. Okay, what changes are coming down the pipeline? Um, and these, some of them have been going for quite a long time, but we, we believe we're getting fairly close to, to actually adopting them now. Um, previously, all our structural design codes were based on British standards um, due to our colonial type history. We've always tended to base them on European standards. Obviously, since Britain uh, became part of the EU, uh, they then became part of the EN's documentation in uh, the family, EN family, CEN family, sorry. And so the British standards have been withdrawn. They're not available anymore. So we're in the process of looking at adopting 1992-1-1, which is the design of concrete structures, and obviously modifying it we use in South Africa that are different to what they use in Europe. So that's the structural design uh, part of it. In Europe, the documents that go with that in terms of the construction uh, of concrete structures is two documents, uh, EN-206, which is for concrete, the material, and EN13670, which is for execution. So that covers the mixing, transporting, placing, finishing, curing, all of those things. So we already adopted those as SANS50206 and SANS53670. Unfortunately, you can't use them. The intention we had adopted them is that we were going to use them as a basis for changing our standards or for as a basis for our new, new standard. The reason you can't be used, they can't be used is that they still every reference to any other standard in there or to test methods or to product references are all to EN standards. And most of those things are not available, different products in South Africa. Some of them are, we've adopted the EN cement standards. Um, not 100% in line with that. We have slightly different testing temperatures. So the strengths you'll get here will be slightly different to what you get in Europe. Um, the, the additives, extenders are all EN ones. The, um, admixtures, we haven't adopted the aggregate uh, requirement, and all the test methods there are very, most of them slightly different to ours. So you can't really use those documents. So be aware of that. We just had a case recently where some client had insisted on using it, they're a European-based client, and said, oh, we've got the EN here, we'll use it because they know it. The problem is you can't enforce it here because no one can carry out all the EN tests. So just be aware of that. So the intention, is to actually replace SANS 2001 with the adaptation of 206 and 13670. Originally, we started off looking at it in two parts because they are two totally different documents. The intention and those adaptations are almost complete. The intention was to actually uh, yeah, put them into one bottle. No, I'm, I'm seeing a meeting. Sorry, can you mute yourself, please? Um, so the adaptations are almost there. Um, Mark Alexander and myself were largely involved in those. And unfortunately, we've been very involved with putting the new Fulton together over the last three, four years. So this has come to a stop, but they, the adaptations are almost there. Um, the problem is looking at them now, it's almost impossible to put them both into one document. They are so different. So we've approached the Bureau and I just got an email just before I came onto this uh, Zoom 
that they've accepted our thing. So we will end up with a SANS 2001 CC1A for concrete and CC1B, which will be for uh, execution of structures. In addition to that, the SANS, because we're going for SANS 10100, replacing that with uh, the EN document, SANS 10100 part two will be irrelevant and withdrawn. So a lot of that's a code of practice. Most of the information, the relevant information in 10100 will be included in our modification of EN206 and 13670. So we'll definitely put all the local uh, information that's relevant into that particular document. In terms of test methods for concrete and concrete, they're all being moved as with all construction test methods to the SANS 3001 series. If anyone's ever tried to find a particular SANS method, there's no logic to the numbering that they used to be. You could have a test for aggregates next to a test for condoms, next to a test for beer, for wine. There was just no standard. So they've standardized it now in the 3001 series. Most of the aggregates have already moved into that. So they'll be in the 3001 AG series. Uh, the bitumens will be in the 3001 BI. Uh, gravels will be in the GR. And we're moving into the um, CO series. So SANS 3001 CO series, which will cover all the concrete test methods. In doing that, we've actually tried to bring them update and bring them in line with a lot of the European methods where possible. And in addition, uh, we've adopted uh, three or four new European methods which deal with self-compacting concrete because we don't actually have those methods in our, in our suite of test methods. So all the tests on fresh concrete will be in SANS 3001 CO1. I think there's 13, I'll show that just now. 13 of them, all the tests in hardened concrete will be in SANS 3001 CO2-1, CO2. Two CO two uh, dash and then one two three four and CO three will be all the concretes and concrete structures. Um, all the tests on aggregates are being moved into the three thousand and one AG series. They go up to about forty five at the moment, but that's all the road aggregates and everything like that. Uh, there's still some aggregate tests for concrete that aren't in that series that still need to be moved across. And once we've moved all the, the concrete test methods across, the working group will start, and they've already started on looking at moving the aggregate test methods across. And as I mentioned earlier, they've been updated to bring them in line with the EN methods where possible. So just to show you here, this would be in terms of the, the fresh concrete. Um, you can see there's the old methods. And if anyone's bought the new edition of Fulton, um, there's an addix, appendix at the back which shows all these changes and what the numbers are and what they're going to be. So you can see there, we've got 13 uh, methods uh, for, um, for fresh concrete, and we've now included another four or five which deal with uh, self-compacting concrete. In terms of the uh, hardened concrete, uh, there we've adopted, so they've all basically moved across. And then the tests on concrete structures largely deal with the durability index testing, which is, CO3-1, 2, and 3, and uh, CO3-5 uh, will be the drilling preparation and testing for compressor strength of cores. We'll move in there. In terms of timing, uh, the 2001 CO1 series are almost ready to go. So they will hopefully be out early in the new year. As soon as they're done, we'll then move with the CO2 series. In terms of CO3, uh, 1, 2, and 3 are already there. They have been for a while already. Um, and it's just a case of moving the, um, the concrete core method into that lot of specifications. In terms of aggregates, um, SANS 1083, which currently is aggregates for concrete, um, is being modified. There's been concern in the industry, particularly the aggregate industry, that we have totally different requirements when it's aggregate for concrete or aggregates for asphalt or aggregates for base courses and things like that, with significant proliferation of different grading requirements. So the industry has basically agreed we will modify 1083 into a document, one standard called aggregates for construction. And that will be in there. So hopefully that will reduce the proliferation of grading requirements. It will only cover requirements. It won't give you any guidance as to what tests need to be done where and what uh, acceptance criteria are relevant. Uh, guidance on the applicability of the methods and interpretation of the results. The intention is that the industry will put a document together that will be available freely on all industry websites that can be updated quickly and easily. And so it will be CCSA's website, Sabita, Spaza, Road Federation, and any others. There's going to be six parts in the new document. Part one is aggregates for concrete. Part two, aggregates for water and plaster. 
aggregate part three for gabions and ballast, part four is aggregates for asphalt, part five aggregates for surfacing, and part six will be the G1 to G10 materials, aggregates for roadworks. So one standard for all aggregates going forward. What are some of the implications of some of these changes, particularly in the design, design code and specification area? Well, firstly, uh, the way we currently design, we design to make sure that the structure will stay up and then look at if it has to be made durable, what do we need to do to make it durable? The new requirements in the new code, the way the Europeans work, is that the first thing you have to do is determine what environment is your structure going to be in and how long does it have to stay or perform in that particular environment. Based on that, you would then determine the required durability. You then choose an approach, and there's a number of different approaches one can do. One can do the deem to satisfy. There can be a performance type requirement. And only then do you do the structural design. So the, the new codes include a whole lot of different exposure classes. Um, there's basically the, the different ones. The X0 means there's no risk. XC means there's carbonation risk. XD is chlorides other than seawater. XS is corrosion by chlorides from seawater. XF is free thaw, and XA is for chemical attack. And one way that you can choose your, um, the way you specify durability would be to use this table, which would be a deemed to satisfy. So you don't necessarily do any tests. You don't specify oxygen permeability or anything. Uh, effectively, you would just have to specify, you'd have to meet these requirements. So example, for example, if you took a, um, an XS2 cement, for example, maximum water cement ratio you can put in, the strength would have to be a C35 plus 45. The reason it's specified like that is that it, uh, in the new code, they allow cylinders and cubes. So that's why there's two components to every strength. Um, obviously, the one is for cylinders, the one for cubes. There'd then be nominal cover because they're down here. There'd be some items on, I just found my mouse, it's disappeared. Um, there we go. Um, so nominal cover, and then if there's air content, which is not applicable here, and then the different cement types that you can actually use and gives you some idea of curing. Alternatively, you can go the route that we've done to some extent in South Africa in terms of specifying uh, durability index testing, uh, which is a performance-based spec, whereas this is more a prescriptive type based specification. The new specification deals with concrete as concrete. It covers concrete mixed on site, concrete mixed irradium mixed plant, and concrete produced in a plant for precast yards. So all of those things will be covered in the new uh, standard. It defines ready mix concrete as concrete delivered in a fresh state by a body who is not the user. So it can include concrete produced off-site by the user, concrete produced on-site, but not by the user. Um, and the result of this is that ultimately SANS 878, which is our current um, ready mix spec, will disappear. The revised specification, uh, all your performance-based things are in classes. So you can specify your workability or consistency of concrete, either in terms of slump test, where we know it, by VB for very, very stiff uh, jobs, by compaction or by flow. And in each of them, there would then be different classes. So you would specify, if you wanted somewhere between 50 and 90 slump, you'd specify an S2 class. And the contractor can work in between there where he wants to. Uh, in terms of VB table, different classes of VB time in seconds, degrees of compactability, and flow. Um, so one can specify whichever ones of those you want, and the contractor would then have to, have to comply with it. So in conclusion, um, specifications must be carefully considered to ensure that the required properties or performance are included. Specifications need to be enforced. So if you're putting a specification out there, you need to make sure that it gets project gets built to that specification. It's important that you use a combination of both standard specifications, but with a detailed project specification. And then be aware of the changes that are coming. And also please make sure that you use the latest specification. Changes that are coming, approaches, obviously you need to then, if you're doing a design, you need to determine the environment and required longevity. Make sure that you can make it last in terms of durability. Choose how you want to do that. And then only do you determine the structural design. So there's changes coming in the design codes, in the standards, material specifications, and test methods. So please be aware and specify very correctly. Unfortunately, the Bureau don't 
adequately advertise when new specifications have been issued or published. Um, so we need to try and, uh, and at CCSA, we will try and do that. When these new ones are put out, we can put them on our website, maybe just to indicate these are the latest specifications that have just been uh, published. With that, uh, only um, Michelle, thanks very much. Brian, thank you very much. Wow. Um, it's really eye-opening to see how easily um, specifications are still being done incorrectly. Um, I have a question in the chat line from Johan van Weyck. Um, jo Johan wants to know, how is the industry informed that there are changes that have been implemented? Um, Brian? Over to you. I think I, I alluded to that right at the end. Um, I don't think the Bureau do a very good job. Um, so I think it's going to be up to organizations like CCSA to maybe have a, a section on our website where we can alert people to as new publication, new uh, documents are actually published, uh, we can put them on the website so they'll know it will be a ready retina where people can go at any time and go and see what new ones have actually been put up. Right. So I think uh, Hanli, Hanli, I'll talk to Hanli and, and um, Natasha about that and we'll look at putting something like that on our website. I see uh, Johan wants to also, he's asking and how can we help with updating of specs? Okay, the, um, obviously there's working groups um, and I know Johan's been part of that. So there is a working group. Uh, currently, I think uh, John Roxborough from CCSA and uh, Barry Pierce are on the, the, the testing methods and the, the aggregate specifications. And really, the more people we can get involved there to try and drive these things, so you can get hold of John Roxborough at, at uh, CCSA. In terms of the aggregate, uh, the 1083 specification, um, we reached agreement a week or two back. Um, the standards are so different between the six parts that what we've agreed now is that I just need to put it all into one. And then we'll circulate to two different industry bodies. So we'll send it to a sponsor, uh, to people like that, or people that we know would have an interest in providing input into it. So just try and get overall input, and then we can hand it over to the Bureau to make sure it gets put in the right format. Great. Um, Kenneth has raised a question, Brian. Um, would you make a specification of the durability index for concrete mixes as opposed to uh, uh, the WB ratios? Look, um, water binder ratio is, is no measure of, of durability, unfortunately. Um, and we saw that in the UK uh, when the new cement started coming in and they used um, grinding them finer and finer, so you get away with less cement. And they've now got massive durability problems there. So um, just changing water binder and cement type is often not enough. And that's why one needs to go the route either the deem to satisfy that table that I showed or to specify particular durability uh, using the index test, you know, the oxygen permeability, chloride conductivity, if you're in one of those environments uh, to make sure that it, that it works. Uh, what a binder ratio is, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily address all of those. It, it works for some of them, but not, um, but not for others. Um, as Tina says, many batch plants do not have durability index for their mixes readily available. Do you think they will start developing at the uh, to have the, to have those results? Well, I think that, that depends how many people start specifying durability index tests. I mean, for all Sanral projects, um, that's a given. That's built into the new COTA specification. So if you're doing a COTA doc document, you will have to meet those, uh, those requirements. Um, and I'm sure other road authorities will also start following because uh, my understanding is that they're all now bound by the new COTA document. And there it has those durability requirements in it. Thanks, Brian. Um, if anybody has another question, if you would like to raise your hand, um, we still have a few minutes left. Nobody? Oh, one more. Kenneth, would you like to ask straight out? Uh, yes, yeah, if you don't mind, Hi, Brian. Um, Hi. You hear a lot, uh, well, not a lot, but you hear a bit of it on in uh, the international environment that there are uh, a, sort, a shortage or starting to be a shortage of sand aggregate for concrete mixes. 
um, just due to the rate of development in certain countries. Is there any, or do you know about any shortages in our country um, relating to uh, proper aggregate for, for re relating to sand? Well, I think, you know, um, a lot of the really mixed concrete in this country uses uh, crushed, crushed aggregate sand, you know, used pressure sand. Um, so if you're crushing the aggregate, there will always be sand there as well. I think what you're referring to is natural sand. And yes, that is becoming a problem. It's getting more and more difficult to, to dredge it out of rivers and things like that. So more and more, I think uh, we are already moving. Most of our projects use some type of crusher sand, um, often blended with a, with a finer river sand. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Brian, um, Johan has asked, do you know which laboratories can do those durability tests? Um, there are a, a number of them. Um, largely the universities can do them. Um, and I think there are some others. I'm not sure of all of them who can do it. Uh, at this stage, I'm not sure if any of them are accredited for the test. Um, so while there are some and the universities generally, while they can do the test, are generally not accredited for the test because their labs generally don't do commercial testing on a large scale. See, there's a hand from Dennis. Yes, uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, I just have a, a, I don't know whether it's a question or a comment regarding SABS 1200. Yeah. Uh, you see, the National Department of Public Works is one of the it's one of the big infrastructure investors, and uh, right. as far as I remember, they are still requiring uh, consultants to use SABS twelve hundred for the specification. Yeah, and and that that my understanding, they were party Public Works uh, a whole lot of that two thousand and one meeting. They were very anti it, but the overall feeling at that meeting was that we need to replace it. And I think that the difficulty for government departments is because not all the 1200s have changed into the 2001. Uh, to, to have some that have then got measurement and payment and others don't have measurement and payment, it creates a problem. And we've been dealing with the Bureau on this problem to try and say, well, you know, then you must basically withdraw all the, the 1200 series. You know, if you can't get them into the 2001 series, then you need to withdraw them um, because very few people are actually using the 2001 series. And if you use the 1200 series, you've got to have a huge uh, project spec that goes with it because a lot of that stuff is out of date. As I say, the, the cements that are in there, you can't get those cements anymore. So I don't know if they're putting a project spec to overwrite that. And if, you, if you're consulting engineers, then you should ideally be doing that. If you're forced to use 1200G, then you should be writing a project spec, which puts all the latest requirements, the latest cement types, things like that in, into your project specification to do that. Yes, yeah, we do that, but you know, we we, we read it through with uh, the updates on the S Sans 2001, but it's, yes, it's quite yeah. a mission, yeah, it's quite a mission, but it's just, yeah. I think it's important maybe if the industry can engage with public works to get them to, to change their stance maybe. Uh, we've we've been trying. Um, obviously, the, the first way to do that would be to get the bureau to be rest, uh, not the bureau to get the uh, department uh, represented on the technical committee at the bureau, and we virtually battled to get any government departments to to put representatives on on that committee. Um, effectively, the, the committee is largely the members of um, of Cement and Concrete SA, cement companies, one or two academics, and one or two people from industry, but generally. Uh, very, very slow. You know, you don't get paid for it. it takes a lot of time sitting in those committees. Um, so, and, and you know, if they really want to influence stuff, that's where they need to be. It doesn't help that when the new standard comes out, they say, oh, we're not prepared to use it. Um, so we are talking to the Bureau to try and get that resolved so that they ultimately withdraw all of those. So then people will be forced to actually use the new ones. Okay. I think for, for public works, maybe the starting point will be to ask them to review the the civil engineering manuals. They, I think they right. last revised it in 2012. Now look, I'm trying to get hold of the right people there. If you've got a contact there that um, that we can use to, to go and talk to them, by all means, let me have it. And uh, if you have a contact, we can go and talk to them. Uh, okay, yeah, it's Joseph. 
His name is Joseph. I think the chief engineer there. I'll I'll, okay. I'll send you an email with the details. Yeah. Okay. If you wouldn't mind, please, Dennis. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Right. Sure. So thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think all I can say is sure, thank you, Brian. Uh, the information you shared was of real value to this event itself. Um, and I'd like to hand over to, to Hanley Turner for closing off of this meeting today. Hanley? Thank you, Michelle. And just a huge thank you to the Inland Branch for arranging this talk. Uh, uh, really a high note to finish the concrete fixes uh, for this year. Um, a reminder for, for all of those who are looking for CPD points, make sure that you've um, RSVP to Natasha, send her your details, otherwise you will not be on the CPD register. And just a note on the CPD points, we've had um, communication from our CPD accreditation body that we're currently using, that they've just had a slight hiccup um, it's being sorted, so the CPD points for this event and the previous event will be a little bit de delayed, but they should be on the website early in the new year. So thank you, and thank you again to all the branches. Thank you for the Inland Branch, Michelle. Good luck for everybody, and thank you to all the members on board. We appreciate your support, and those that aren't members, please be sure to contact Natasha Pulse to talk about membership, look at our website, have a good festive season and keep well. Thank you, everybody.